I'm starting off by just talking about like, what is the really big end of scaling look like? So I spent years as an SRE at Google. Uh, I was there for, I want to say seven and a half, eight years, something like that. Uh, so I started as, as a regular SRE, as doing uh, individual engineering work and I grew to become an SRE manager. I had teams of people who were working on various projects uh, at Google. And we had at Google a very, very large scale monolithic repository for, for all of our code. So gigantic amounts of code that had to all work together all the time. So let's take a look at that. So we have one repository, billions of lines of code, billions of files growing exponentially as they grew people, they grew faster, they, the whole code base got larger, faster. Everything is shared. There is no forking. There is no uh, different branches, except for a few things for doing, for keeping a release stable. Uh, but other than that, everything is pretty much, you are at head all the time. You're always compiling against tip of all of your dependencies. And since they can't fork, that means everybody at that company has to agree on what those dependencies are. And you can't just say, I'm gonna lock these dependencies for this project because everybody's moving the dependencies forward continuously. And it's 100,000 engineers, right? More than 100,000 engineers. And they're all building stuff, building on each other, trying to make everything work. And there's a lot of bots that go with it. So that's doing a lot of churn into the code base as well. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> Let's reality check that billions. But a lot of people say like, okay, really billions? I mean, you know, a kernel, an operating system kernel is only maybe 10 million, 20 million, 30 million lines of code. So it's two orders of magnitude smaller. You gotta be kidding me. Their code base couldn't be that big, right? So think about this for a second. If you have 100,000 engineers, maybe they produce 100 lines of code on a productive day and they have maybe 100 productive days a year, you hope at least, that's a billion lines by itself right, every year. And one hopes that there's a little bit more productivity there, but those are rough order of magnitude estimates. It really is that big. So <clears throat> if you had even one commit from each of those engineers every two weeks, you'd still have over 10,000 a day, right? So the code base has to be continuously changing. The repository for all these people is keeping up with commits going really fast. <clears throat> the average commit rate for both humans and bots is much higher than that, right? The real commit rate is huge. Many commits per second all day long because there's development houses, development uh, offices throughout the world, right? So you've got it in every time zone, commits a second around the clock. So <clears throat> the biggest problem here is that we have a giant amount of productivity loss, right? Every Everything that slows down an engineer when you've got 100,000 of them adds up really fast. If you've got millions of commits a day, every little delay, everything that slows you down, everything that keeps you from moving forward is going to cost the company and cost the teams just ridiculously large amounts. It's infuriating, it's flow destroying. It's the kind of thing that keeps you from getting the programming that you want done because you're spending all of your time trying to figure out how to deal with all the problems that you've got. So without constant attention, this will cause the net progress to just go to grind to a halt, right? There's, there would be no progress. You've got the, the scaling problem that comes with lots of different teams working together, but then the big code base makes it even worse. The mythical man month strikes, it's just horrible. So <clears throat> there are some problems that Google has already managed to solve. They figured out what needs to be done, what is necessary to get past these problems. There are also some that they didn't solve and we'll talk about those a little bit later. Okay, <clears throat> so as I was saying, you've got many commits a second. That means everybody is always stale in their checkouts. You never have an up-to-date checkout. So how do you deal with getting the latest repository changes and being able to do your compiles and making sure that those compiles will actually work when you, at the time that you commit them, that can be several commits later and suddenly stuff doesn't work, right? The, the dependency changed out from under you in between when you ran your tests 
and when something happened, when something got committed. And you have the additional problem that when you wake up in the morning, all of your stuff is out of, out of date. So everybody in other time zones has managed to make millions of lines of code changes to the code base. And you don't have any, like you're gonna have to download all these changes, you think. So how do we fix that? Oh, I guess there's also a problem of the compute resources. I forgot about this. The, if you were trying to keep up, you would spend all of the compute resources that we could allocate per engineer just doing your compiles, right? If you were wanting to make sure that you were always up to date compiling everything, that wouldn't scale at all. And you'd spend the first several hours of your day trying to get everything up to date. So solution, invest in tools, right? The, the first thing that you wanna do is make sure that you've got some build tools that will allow you to aggressively prune the dependency trees that you have, right? You wanna say, if, if every little piece of this project isn't needed, then we're not going to include it in our dependencies. So there's already things that obviously do this for the front end where they say, we wanna pack this down to a smaller size to, in order to hand to the browser. But you also wanna do that in terms of your dependencies because you want to make sure that there is absolutely nothing that you are depending upon that you don't actually need. And you need the builds process to understand that. You need it to understand when things can be done and when they can't. <clears throat> so the other possibility is there's uh, a, an opportunity to do a sort of hybrid. You've got a monolithic repository where all of your code is, but you don't have to use that as the way that people are contacting the repository for their day-to-day -day operations. You can use a distributed version control system like Git or Mercurial to be the front end for it. Right? So you can say, all right, you can do your local work and do little commits locally and not have to deal with the commits into the master tree. And in the meantime, everybody else is able to get their stuff done, slows things down a little bit, but also allows you to work locally. <clears throat> the compile caches are <clears throat> a matter of saying, okay, if, if we would be spending all of our compute capacity dealing with just compiling, why don't we share that? Because we know that we have a single monolithic repository. We can watch what TIP is doing continuously, and we can make sure to cache the compile information that happens from every single commit, right? So you can amortize quickly across the company how much compute has to be done to get the thing to compile ahead because every project that's getting continuously compiled by somebody else out there is being cached globally for everybody else to use for doing their builds. <clears throat> the uh, source control systems are represented as file systems so that they are visible as something that you can use basic Unix tools to look around. You can say, okay, <clears throat> uh, I'd like to see what the commit the history was at a certain commit, and that will be visible in the file system. That's fine. But it also allows you to say things like, we're going to use an overlay file system. So all of your changes that you're making locally are just overlaid virtually onto the global history so that you're not actually downloading everything every time. You're only getting the changes that you made plus the knowledge of all the caches of what's above. Okay, another problem. So every time you compile, you're against new version zero dependencies. That means that your compiles are not repeatable. You don't know what has changed since the last time that you did that commit, the last time that you made a change, the last time that you did a build. So <clears throat> you think dependency hell is bad when you're dealing with NPM or something like that. Imagine the dependency hell when everybody, there's 100,000 people, a city full of engineers who are trying to change out everything from under you all day long, right? Even back-to-back -back builds can be a complete mess. People can't tell whether they were flaky, their tests are flaky or their code is flaky, or whether it was just that the dependencies changed and everything changed out from under them. <clears throat> so you also have a lot of tests many, 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 many in the code base, as you can imagine. And you can't run them all every test debug cycle. They're even slower than the compiles. So now what? Okay, so you can run those tests in pieces at different levels. And I'll talk about that in a second. 
you have uh, the, the flaky test problem now becomes a public menace. It isn't just a problem for you for building your own stuff and knowing what you've done. If you put an actual flaky test committed into the repository, everybody else in the city of engineers is going to see a flaky test as well. So now everybody's <laughs> flaky tests have multiplied against everybody else's. Imagine trying to get a green build. So we've had cases when I was working uh, as an SRE on one of the teams where somebody said, well, okay, you did the commit. You had to have had your tests green. How did you get them green? Oh, I reran the tests 14 times, <clears throat> and then I was able to actually get the thing committed. That's just horrible. Okay, solution again, invest in tools, right? The progressive testing thing, you do some set of tests that happen immediately, some tests that happen pre-commit time, so pre-submit as we would call it at Google, <clears throat> and then you have other tests that run at commit, other tests that run after commit and check whether things were a problem. If they happen after commit and they actually discover a problem, then they may have to roll your code back and then you may have to figure out what to do about the fact that your code just got backed out of the repository. <clears throat> but that's better than having to run all the tests all the time. So <clears throat> you can't even have human reviewers review your code until the first several layers of those tests happen because you don't want to waste the time of all of your senior engineers either, right? You want to make sure that uh, they, they wait to do reviews until all of the linters all of the extensive pre-submit tests have already passed before the code review system even forwards the, the commit to be reviewed. We also want to automate flaky test isolation because with 100,000 engineers, if each of them produces just a single flaky test every week, you still end up with so many that you couldn't keep track of manually isolating those things. So automated systems check and say, has this test succeeded a certain number of times? Has it failed a certain number of times? Is there any indication whether this is a flaky test or whether it's dealing with its dependencies? There's other things that it checks. If it, notify, if it notices that there's a test that's flaky, it pulls that test out, separates it out, moves it to a separate file and says, these tests will only run for specific requests because otherwise they might cause everybody to deal with the flakiness problem. Okay, so you want to do API changes. <sighs> You've got a problem here that if everybody is running the same version of everything, if you want to change an API low down in the system, you're going to have to change it for every caller at the same time, right? Because you can't fork, so you can't have multiple versions of your API in the system at the same time because that's how they're doing it. It's mono repository, everybody running ahead. And you can't have any of the code using the old version. Otherwise it won't work, it won't build, let alone run in properly in, in production. Okay, so you can either, when you create a new API or, or decide that you're going to change an API, you can either create a new API, like a separate, not just a separate version, but a completely separate API, and then convince 100,000 people to switch, or you can change the thousands of callers yourself without making any mistakes. Now think about that for a second. You're going to go and look at every single other person's code in the entire code base and determine whether or not your patch to their code is going to work with their stuff. Good luck with that. Even if you could get commit approval from all of the owners of all of those projects in your reverse dependency graph, so the farther down you are the chain, the worse this is going to get, the more different people are going to be depending on your code. Even if you get commit approval from all of those, that's happening asynchronously. It may take days, it may take weeks to convince everybody to sign off on your changes. Because each section of the code, each project is owned by a team, and so the team owner has to sign off on the changes. As they're doing that, the code base is changing. It's getting even worse as the things go. And trying to get your API, trying to do this manually would be basically impossible. So invest in tools, right? I'm sure you're starting to see a theme here. Uh, 
you can automatically find all the callers of an API and rewrite them. So we had <coughs> teams of people who were specialized in the compilers of each language that we used in production. And they would write sort of meta tools that allowed you to write changes to your code base. So you could say, for example, I am adding an extra parameter to this C++ function, and it's used in this particular way, and I want every single caller in the entire code base to provide me with this API. And they would have code rewriters that would allow you to do that sort of thing. Then once you have this massive diff, all of the callers of your API being changed, you need to split that into pieces that can be approved by all the owners. You don't want to do that by hand. Again, there's a tool for that. If you want to get all those pieces out for review and check whether people are approving those changes or not allowing them, you're going to have to have a tool for that as well because you can't write 100,000 emails without the email system going like, eh, that's not okay. Okay, what about finding what you need? So you can't understand the entire code base. There's mathematically, it's growing so fast that even if you understood all of the code base today, you can't understand it all tomorrow because there's not enough time to understand all the changes. But you still need to be able to do your job. You need to be able to understand the APIs that you have to work with. So how are you gonna find these things? How are you gonna understand even the structure of the repository? It's so big, there are so many projects, you don't even know where stuff is. Well, <clears throat> So if you've got billions of files, uh, it's not really discoverable, right? You can't just sort of say, oh, we're going to use a good naming convention and then we'll know where things are. That doesn't work. First of all, people are bad at naming conventions and at Google, they're even worse. Um, I can't tell you how many projects thought they were clever with a name from Greek mythology and then realized there were three other projects with the same code name that also doesn't have anything to do with what they were doing. So that's not gonna work. Even if you had a full copy of the repo, you couldn't search it locally because your machine just can't, right? Like you just, there's too much to search. That's too much processing to do for you to be able to do it on your local workstation. And since it's being continuously updated, you can't get the updates to the indexes that would allow you to search that in any reasonable amount of time, or you would take down the network trying to transfer just the data for the updated indexes. That's not going to work either. And those are big, right? Like if you're going to, to do indexes against a billion lines of code and have it be language aware, where you can say things like, I want to find all the cases where this API is used this way, that's going to be a really big index. Thankfully, Google's good at search, right? This is one of the cases where it wasn't just investing in tools in general, it was investing in the core business of Google, which is understanding how to do search better. So you have a dedicated service and in a fit of good naming, by the way, this is actually called code search. Uh, you can do that for getting really powerful low latency searches and ones that'll work across language, cross API, allow you to say things like, I want to find the places that the language binding for this language called this lower uh, level native API in this way. So that API refactoring tool, this has to be best friends with the code search engine, right? Figuring out how to, to refactor all that code has to be able to search through the entire code base efficiently and in a way that makes it easy for you to write those rewrites. <clears throat> okay, so <laughs> this joke gets told to every new Googler, new Googler on day one, right? Welcome to Google, some documentation may be out of date. Uh, let's just say that this is a problem that has been a problem since the day that Google started. So out of documentation, out of date documentation is really awful for a million different reasons. But one of the things is that if you're constantly changing the APIs and you can't figure out why the thing that you compiled against that API is no longer working, let's say somebody didn't do one of those rewrites properly, it's possible. Uh, how are you going to actually check and go, okay, uh, what was the API supposed to be? And uh, well, if that's out of date, then you're going, I'm using it correctly. I'm doing the thing and it's not working. 
So it's even worse because there is a certain subset of engineers who absolutely refuse to document, right? They just are like, that's somebody else's job. Tech writer do that. I'm doing the, the, the coding. Okay, that's bad for a lot of different reasons, but there's a subset. And if you've got 100,000 engineers, you're absolutely gonna have some of those folks. And you need a lot of docs for billions of lines of code. Think of any project that you've ever worked on. If it was properly documented, there was probably significantly more documentation than there was actual code because it takes more words to say something about an API than to actually use the API. That's just, it's a lot. So this time, instead of investing in a tool or search, we're investing sort of in a mental judo, right? We change the way we ask people to do documentation so that it becomes something that isn't a major pain, doesn't get in the way of getting their job done. So put the docs next to the source trees so that a project owner, one of those people who has to approve all those changes can say, I'm going to make a pre-submit test in my project that you cannot commit unless you have committed in, you cannot commit into the code tree unless you've also commented and committed into the doc tree. That's a first level check, but remember this happens before it goes to a human reviewer. So they can say like, basically, did you make a change? Then it goes to the human reviewer. And if the thing is, this is the doc, then that's not going to make it through the human reviewer, right? And you're probably going to have a discussion with the tech lead. So that's kind of pushing people to do the docs in the first place, but then there's the flip side of it, making it easier for them. So let's expose every language's internal docs and annotations so that they are easier to view, right? Most languages these days have some way to do powerful annotations and you want them not to just to be visible in an IDE, but you want them to be visible in the code search tool. You want them to be visible in any online documentation viewers so that everybody can just all the time see that stuff without having to write the documentation again for every API. <clears throat> so the other thing, and this one is amazingly powerful and also close to my heart because this is something that I love, switch to documentation formats that don't suck, right? Use ones that are designed to be easy for coders to do. If they have to go and write their documentation in a documentation system that they're not used to doing for their coding, it's a mental switch, right? It's making them think in a different way. And you don't want to do that. You want to keep people in the flow of doing their coding and have the documentation be so similar that it's not that much more painful. So using text-based formats, Markdown, GraphViz, and so on and so forth, and then having tools or servers that automatically convert those so that they look like normal documents, like actual good formatters for Markdown, so on and so forth, makes a huge difference. GitHub learned this, of course, like, hey, we're going to automatically notice when you've got a readme.md, and we're going to format it in a reasonable way so that people can view it. And surprisingly, so many more people writing readmes, right? Works at scale as well. Okay. All of those were ones that Google found a solution for. Now there's a few that Google didn't find a solution for. Okay, you can't keep up everything all day. I've said that like 12 different ways in this, but there's also the problem of if you feel like you want to get your job done, you've got to be able to know all the things that you depend on and understand what that technology stack looks like, or you don't feel like you can do your job. If you were doing it all day, every day, you'd never be able to keep up. So how do you need to, how do you keep up with the things that you need to know to do your job well? Let's say that somebody invents a new data API that will make your use case so much easier. How do you know, right? How do you socialize if you're the person who invented that new API? How do you socialize that to 100,000 engineers? How do you get a little bit of their time to teach them about what your benefit is. <clears throat> and who supports all these people when the migration hits a roadmap, a road bump, right? You've got a lot of people trying to keep up with their project and make sure that their project is using the technologies that will make it most effective and easiest to manage, most reliable, so on and so forth. <clears throat> 
However, none of these people have time to really learn your API. When they're switching to it, they've probably got an OKR, a, a quarterly project, that basically says, get this migration done. And they don't have time to learn it to the level that you do. They're going to hit a road bump. You have thousands of projects. That's a thousands of edge cases. You're going to find the case that your API is not handling well. Right? Somebody out there is going to find the thing that your API was weak at. So now who helps those people? Scalably. Because you can't have the developer themselves doing it all the time. They would never get anything else done than supporting the thousands of projects that are trying to use their API. Notice I didn't have a solution there. <clears throat> uh, another problem, platform churn, right? So if there's lots of people at lower levels who are designing great new APIs, uh, you can have sizable engineering teams that are doing nothing but switching to those APIs, migrating from one thing they don't have control over to another thing they don't have control over all day long all quarter long, all year long. <clears throat> so there's a problem here. <clears throat> the problem in some sense is the VPs. And the reason is because each of them has an incentive to try and get their projects migrated away from their old stuff to their new stuff. They want to be able to turn off all of the services that were supporting their old API or their old server or whatever and they want to switch to the new one. They want to be able to say, I got this done. All the projects want to be able to say they got this done, and they can't say they've got it done until they've migrated the entire billions of line code base. So at some point, the VP says, all right, I'm just going to make this a requirement. I'm a VP. I'm allowed to do this. I'm going to say that everybody has to finish doing their migration by the end of July, right? Now, all of the reverse dependencies have requirements to make all those changes within that time frame. And if you have five VPs who all say this, all of them are demanding that everybody get their project work done by the end of the next quarter, you suddenly have all of the team's programming time being spent doing migrations on those different things. So of course, what happens is they escalate to the, to the executive vice presidents. I think go up another level and they say, all right, you two fight it out. Let's get a decision from the executive vice president and he'll tell us which ones we're going to work on. Inevitably what happens is half of them are approved. The other half are put off for the next quarter. So you've now sort of kicked the can along. The problem is that every project ends up taking twice as long to migrate as you thought it did because of those road bumps that we talked about earlier. So now you have all of your time filled up this quarter and next quarter, good luck planning. This is, as I point there, a really fast recipe for burning out your engineers, right? Engineers want to do amazing things. They don't want to spend all of their time doing migrations. Okay. These, the VPs have this incentive and the individual contributors have this incentive and the tech leads and the managers and so on and so forth. There are incentives up and down the chain to increase this problem, to make this rate of change even worse than it already is. So <clears throat> if you have, as Google does, a requirement that engineers, to, in order to grow, in order to get promoted, in order to get higher, uh, um, into higher level positions, need to indicate their ability to create impact and change, then pretty soon that's what they optimize for, right? You have all of these engineers who go, hey, I want to make sure that I get promoted at some point, so I need to have some impact. And the way that I'm going to get that impact is I'm going to, to convince a lot of people to use my new API that I've invented. Um, yeah, that line down there at the bottom, they had a lot of impact, but a meteor does too. So <clears throat> there's a running joke about this. The, they had little icons that they would hand out to people as, as prizes for accomplishing various things as engineers. And there's one that has a comet striking the earth and it says T7 impact, right? 
So it's like, in order to get to be a senior, senior engineer, you know, principal engineer or something like that, you have to be able to cause damage to the code base the size of a comet impacting the United States. That would be bad. <clears throat> and, it, and it ends up dominating, right? Like, so everybody individually concerned about getting their promotion, getting the movement forward of their projects, getting budgets approved, all of that is stacking up on each other and then change for its own sake becomes your primary planning tool. Oops. Okay, so here's the final thing here. <clears throat> Google didn't get this right. Those were unsolved problems, but you've got a chance to look at things differently than Google did. Google has a history of going, well, this worked well for us when we were smaller. So if we just do more of it and add some more tools and invest some more, everything will work out. The problem is some things you can't invest in. You have to change the way you do things. You have to change the processes. You have to look at things a different way than you have. So they've solved all of their things with tooling and automation. But the question is, if it was you, if it was you making a recommendation to the VPs or the EVPs or something, what would you recommend? Like, how would you change these things? If you look back at those previous problems, and I'll switch back for a second here, you've got change for its own sake, the broken incentives, the tragedy of the change commons. How would you go about making changes to the structure of the company to allow you to keep good engineers without turning into this mess? Guess what? Don't have an answer for you, but I've got some opinions. So if you ask me later, <laughs> I'll be happy to, to let you know. 